If you remember from our first video, it was the end of 1977, and all three computers that helped light the fire and define the first generation of the personal computer era were announced in shipping. The three computers were the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the TRS-80. This was the 1977 Trinity, the first wave of fully assembled, ready-to-use personal computers that ignited a revolution. Now, when you set up one of these personal computers, you were greeted with a blinking cursor and a simple prompt. At the end of this prompt was the basic programming language that gave a voice to this new generation of computers and its users. At the start, each member of the Trinity spoke its own dialect. The PET came with a basic from a tiny company named Microsoft. The Apple II had a lightning fast integer only version written by its creator, Steve Wozniak. And the TRS-80 booted up with a version of Tiny Basic hammered out under immense pressure by its hardware designer, Steve Leninger. But within just two years, this diversity vanished. The Apple II and the TRS-80 would abandon their homegrown languages and adopt the same one as the PET. And those other basics would just be a footnote in personal computer history. How did one company's code become the standard for an entire industry? This is the story of how Microsoft, through a combination of luck, timing, and shrewd business, started building its accidental empire on the back of its very first product. If you grew up with an Apple II, you likely remember either a greater than prompt or a right bracket prompt. That bracket, the one that most of us, including me, remember, meant you were running AppleSoft Basic, licensed from Microsoft. But the original soul of the machine, the one that came with the first Apple IIs, used the greater than prompt. That was Integer Basic, and it was a masterpiece. It was written entirely by hand on paper by Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak. It was blazingly fast and elegant, a perfect reflection of the hardware that he also designed. But it had a fatal flaw for a machine with ambitions beyond the hobbyist garage. It couldn't do any floating point math. It could only handle whole numbers. This was great for games, but for business, finance, or even a simple checkbook application, it was a non-starter. Woz was more than capable of writing the code. He had even co-authored and published a set of floating point routines in the August 1976 issue of Dr. Dobbs' journal. The problem wasn't ability, it was passion. Wozniak, the hardware artist, had been given a new canvas, the floppy disk. In late 1977, he was consumed by the challenge of designing the controller for the new Disk 2 drive, a project he would later call his finest work at Apple. But while Woz was creating his legendary, hyper-efficient disk controller, the basic project stalled. This is where the other Steve enters the story. Steve Jobs was growing impatient. He saw the lack of floating point as a direct threat to sales. In his biography, Steve Jobs, Isaacson captured the dynamic. Wozniak began to rankle at Jobs' style. Steve was too tough on people. I wanted our company to feel like a family where we all had fun and shared whatever we made. Jobs, for his part, felt that Wozniak simply would not grow up. He was very childlike. He did a great version of basic, but then could never buckle down and write the floating point basic we needed. So we ended up later having to make a deal with Microsoft. He was just too unfocused. Wozniak's focus on the disk two created a software vacuum and Jobs, the pragmatist, moved to fill it. Without Wozniak being fully aware of the negotiations, Apple licensed a 6502 version of basic from Microsoft for a one-time fee of $21,000. Wozniak, on his website, recounts himself the moment it landed on his desk. Somehow, we wound up with a Microsoft 6502 floating point basic one day. I installed it, 
which involved a lot back then, and tested it. Since it was already near completion and only needed some graphics commands added for our Apple, our own effort was best dropped. Mine might turn out to be better in some regards, but it wasn't worth the risk or effort. I have no idea if this basic was written by Microsoft or just found by them. My biggest disappointment was going to the awful string functions like left dollar sign var 5 and mid dollar sign var 253 instead of my own, which were written var 1 colon 5 and var 258 for the first five characters and characters 5 through 8 of a variable. And just like that, the deal was done. Apple's own Randy Wigington adopted the Microsoft code, adding the crucial graphics commands that were in Integer Basic initially. The new language was named AppleSoft. First sold on tape, it became the built-in standard with the Apple II Plus in 1979, and Waz's brilliant Integer Basic was relegated to a firmware card for enthusiasts. But this seemingly small deal ended up having huge consequences. It created a dependency on Microsoft that cast a long shadow over Apple. Years later, when the original AppleSoft license was up for renewal, Bill Gates allegedly used it as leverage. He forced Apple to cancel its own far superior Mac Basic project for the new Macintosh in order to protect Microsoft's competing product. A pragmatic decision in 1977 had come back to haunt Apple allowing its biggest rival to cripple a key piece of software on its next generation computer. Now the story of BASIC on the TRS-80 starts not with a choice, but with a crisis. When Tandy Corporation decided to build a personal computer, they hired engineer Steve Leininger to design the hardware. The software, the all-important basic, was initially outsourced to a contractor named Bob Uterich. Steve recounts that time in episode 142 of the Floppy Days podcast. We, we thought we had the software already taken care of because we were going to have Bob Uterich. We had him signed up to write a basic interpreter for us, but because he'd already done one for the 6800. And it was uh, included in Interface Age magazine on a plastic record. You remember the old plastic re records you could put it in a magazine? Yeah, I, I did see that. Yeah, yeah, so this was called a floppy ROM when they did it. So if you had the right software and everything, you could download the software off of the floppy ROM and run it on 6800. I think he used the Southwest Technical Products. And so we, we'd signed him up to do the basic. Uh, th this was independent of the, the, the hardware design I was doing. And he went into radio silence on us. Couldn't find him. On paper, Uterich was the perfect man for the job. He was an MIT-educated tech enthusiast who had written a version of BASIC for the Southwest Technical Product 6800 for his 12-year-old son because that computer didn't initially come with BASIC in part because the programmer Southwest Technical Products hired failed to deliver. Seeing an opportunity, Uterich made a deal with Southwest Technical Products to sell his BASIC alongside the computer. Uterich would get 100% of the sale of BASIC, and SWTPC would sell more computers. But programming wasn't his day job. He was actually an executive vice president at his family's major international shipping firm out of Tampa, the Uteric Corporation. But then, he vanished. For months, he went radio silent, leaving Leininger and the entire TRS-80 project in jeopardy. But the reason had nothing to do with computers. You see, the Uteric Corporation's shipping business was growing, and it also was heavily involved in the Middle East. And that growth, coupled with the unstable political situation, leading up to the 1979 revolution in Iran, which made up 40% of the company's revenue, was demanding more of the family's attention. With millions of dollars in assets and ships at stake, Bob Uterich's attention was understandably focused on his family's company, not on a side project for Radio Shack. Tragically, the crisis was eventually too much to overcome. 
The Uteric Corporation never fully recovered from the millions in assets seized during the revolution and was eventually forced to declare bankruptcy in 1983. So with Bob Uterich not delivering, it forced a change in plans in Fort Worth. Leininger was told he had to write basic himself. With no time to start from scratch, he grabbed Lee Chen Wang's well-regarded version of Tiny Basic and began adapting it. This version, however, was integer only. That changed on February 2nd, 1977, thanks to a single high-profile program crash. Leininger and his boss, Don French, were demonstrating the prototype to the head of the company, Charles Tandy. They had written a simple basic program to calculate income tax, and they called it H&R Shack, which was a play on H&R Block, a, a big tax preparer. But when Tandy typed in his salary, which was reportedly $150,000, the machine crashed. The 16-bit integers couldn't handle a number larger than 32,000 767. Don French asked Charles Standy to take a pay cut. But the mandate from the top was immediate. The computer had to support floating point numbers. So Leininger went back to work, performing what he called miracle stuff. He ripped out 60% of the original Palo Alto Tiny Basic code and painstakingly integrated a floating point library, all while still adding code to control the keyboard, screen, and cassette player, all from scratch. The final result was a masterpiece of compromise, a functional floating point basic that fit into a minuscule four kilobytes of ROM. This became known as level one basic. But Tandy's executives were already playing a longer game. The name level one was a deliberate marketing strategy. From the very beginning, they planned an upgrade path. In the November-December 1977 issue of People's Computers magazine, co-creator Don French addressed the limitations of their initial offering compared to the Commodore PET's more powerful Microsoft Basic. In that article, both Don French and Chuck Peddle answered a question from People's Computers editor Phyllis Cole, who asked, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the TRS-80 versus the PET? In Don French's reply, he said, as for the advantages of the PET over the TRS-80, there will be none as soon as we come out with our level two basic. People owning a 4K system can replace chips to update to level two basic at a cost of slightly over $100. That level two basic was, of course, licensed from Microsoft. Bill Gates himself said the port took about four weeks. Tandy's strategy was brilliant. Launch with a machine that was incredibly affordable thanks to Leininger's heroic 4K basic, but promise a clear, powerful upgrade path powered by Microsoft should the machine be successful, which it turned out to be. When the TRS-80 became a runaway bestseller, the deal was triggered and Microsoft's Level 2 Basic became the new standard. So by 1979, the deed was done. Microsoft Basic was the standard language for the three most important personal computers on the market. So how exactly did Microsoft do it? First, I think Bill Gates and Paul Allen's true genius was seeing software not as a one-off engineering contract, but as a product that could be licensed over and over again. After a legal battle with MITS, the makers of the Altair, they won back the right to sell their basic to anyone. This basic was easily adapted to other 8080-based computers that came onto the market and eventually was ported to other CPU architectures, such as the Z80 of the TRS-80 and the 6502 of the Commodore PET and Apple II. This allowed them to create a high volume, low cost business model that was perfectly suited for the booming and diverse personal computer market. Second, most computer companies, including both Apple and Tandy, 
were at the core hardware companies. Apple's and Tandy's most brilliant engineers, Steve Wozniak and Steve Leininger, were hardware designers at heart. Writing software was a necessary chore, not their primary passion. For them, it made perfect business sense to pay a fee to an outside company that specializes in BASIC, freeing up their own talent to design the innovative hardware that made their machines special. In the end, licensing Microsoft's code was faster, cheaper, and resulted in a more powerful, feature-rich, and more standard product for their customers. And ultimately, it also sold more computers. Having a powerful and somewhat standard BASIC on your computer meant users could pick up any of the basic programming books or magazines full of programs to type in, and they would mostly work. But how did Bill Gates, Paul Allen, and all these other pioneers actually write a program that could understand and run BASIC? It seems incredibly complex, but I think when you break it down, it's a fascinating puzzle. Maybe we should try and build our own BASIC interpreter. Just like Gates, Wozniak, Leininger, Uterich, Li Chen Wang, and countless others did back then. What do you think? Let me know in the comments if you're interested in that. Also, let me know if you learned to program using BASIC and what version you used, and if typing in programs from books and magazines helped you learn. Also, let me know in the comments if you were like me and always wanted to know how the BASIC interpreter worked and poured over books and magazine articles describing the internals of the program. So until next time, be curious, be kind, and welcome to the People's Computer Club. I am so glad you're here.